you're asking me the question yeah. a materialist atheist would ask. And and you want me to give you an answer that bolsters your faith, but the presumptions of your question are enlightenment atheistic. So, so it's it's fair if you take his view from the very beginning and you understand, okay, what is real is not governed by mere matter. Can you just acknowledge that what you're thinking is not what they're thinking? And and he's so slippery here, and it's very frustrating. You see, the romanticist rubs his hands in glee at the freedom for complete, full self-expression. But Sartre wrings his hands in despair. And that right there. Can you describe the nature of human consciousness without appealing to spiritual language? Harris does it by affirming spirituality in his way, in his meditation. When Sam Harris exposed Jordan Peterson's dishonesty, Pangburn has an obvious anti-Peterson slant. Well, and his audience does as well, so that's fair enough, I suppose. But... We need we need to bridge this divide, and we're only going to bridge this divide if we acknowledge what the other is concerned about and don for a moment their language game, be willing to step into the language game of Peterson. So when he says, so you could describe that as God, or so the transcendent, da, 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 that's what God is. Or when he says, you know, we evolved this reducing mechanism to take all the information of the universe and collapse into something that can be perceived and interacted with, you know, at our various levels of simplicity through the through the eons. But the, the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here is, I think, to try to increase the, what would you call, the breadth of the conversation about how facts get translated into, into values. Because I think the manner in which facts are translated into values is something that actually evolved. And it evolved over three and a half billion years, the three and a half billion years of life. And it built the nervous system from the bottom up. And it built this reducing mechanism that takes the infinite number of facts and translates them into a single value per action. And it does that in layers. And so there is a- You need to acknowledge, okay, Okay, so so what is he doing? He's trying to make an evolutionary argument for this idea that perception is real, you know? We perceive colors, those are real. We perceive music, that's real to us. You know, if there was a being that could not appreciate music in the way we do, the music would not be real, or music at least, to that being. Okay, so then is the meaning that the music produces real? Well, it seems like it is. So then is value, is the meaning of value real? You know, and then he does this and this and this, and we can only interface with some of these truths through story. We distill things down, lessons that can't be rediscovered or understood individually, can't even be articulated because words are so limited. So we try to capture truth in some representational some narrative form because then we're acting things out you know when you hear of the hero the warrior the king the child whatever you know archetypes you there's these layers of, of networks that are activated that are not captured in the word itself and that cannot be described rationalistically itself so it's it's this story that you tell and you have to act out we have to acknowledge that something like that in peterson's view is fundamental to our structure and the, the highest iteration of that is what we call God. I already made one point here. I, I made the point that part of the conception of God that underlies the Western ethos is the notion that whatever God is is expressed in tr the truthful speech that rectifies pathological hierarchies. And that isn't all it does. It also confronts the chaos of being itself and generates habitable order. That's a, that's so if he's describing this and someone's going to come in and just poke apart every single, you know, this is the problem. This is the problem with his sort of brain that is more of a narrative type of brain. You know, there are lots of thinkers and artists and philosophers or lots of philosophers, say, in the recent centuries especially, who were dancing more towards literature, towards poetry, towards art, because as we get more and more aware of our incapacity to describe any sort of objective mind independent reality as we get more and more aware of our inability to even access fundamental reality we start to focus more and more on our experience and that's existentialism and that's modern philosophy well some people have pointed out that what you have in such then is the absolutization of freedom a process that began in um, the enlightenment with its emphasis on freedom from tradition and authority um, enlarged in Kant with his assertion of uh, uh, freedom of the will, the autonomy of the will. And, um, enlarged in 
Hegel, where the whole of history is the gradual manifestation of freedom more and more fully. You see? And now culminating in Sartre, where in his words it is dreadful freedom. You see, the romanticist rubs his hands in glee at the freedom for complete full self-expression. But Sartre wrings his hands in despair. And Peterson has this sort of brain that probably resonates more with the story, more than Harris, certainly more than Dillahunty. And then there are other sorts of brains, you know, Dawkins, who just finds more fascination in unpacking what gene genetics is. And, you know, there's different sorts of brains that are going to speak to different sorts of different um, sectors of the human population. And I think we need to do more work to acknowledge where the divides are and why. Okay, what is this person concerned about? And when he's using these words, what is he attempting to describe? And we need to not get fixated so much, perhaps, on the other possible views from which the words can seem to be insufficient or misleading. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's my frustration with Pangburn's audience anyway, like all the comments below these videos. Okay. About the applause of conventionally religious people who think that their conventional religion is in some way cashed out or redeemed or supported by the reading you're giving now of the of Christ in, in the starry heaven. Yes, and this is absolutely frustrating. And this is still alive very much in Peterson's more recent conversations, as far as I can tell, like with Alex O'Connor, for example. Although there was that shocking moment when Alex said, if, if you took a panic... That's a strange thing. I know you thing. don't like that. Let me put it this way. Yeah. If, if I went back in time with a Panasonic video camera and put that camera in front of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, would the little LCD screen show a man walk out of that tomb? I would say suspect yes. You know, he's like, surely you must recognize that you can say, you know, the ideal transcendent, the Christ figure, blah, 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 something we act out, it's a mode of being, but surely you realize that what these people mean is something else. And Peterson, in the beginning of the conversation, I was actually very happy. He actually attacked the, the religious fundamentalists for once. So, you know, typically he's been reacting to the dangers of the left recently, and he's been, um, I would say, drawing closer and closer to some sort of religious fundamentalism in image or public discourse, if not in his actual expressed beliefs, image or association, I guess, if not in his actual language. Like, if you listen to him now and the way he talks about God, and if you go back to his lectures from 10 years ago, when he was talking more about other religions and Buddhism and Taoism and stuff. But his descriptions have not changed all that much. This is something I think his critics perhaps aren't aware of. They tend to focus more on, you know, his polarizing politics and how he's shifting, you know, towards the Daily Wire and whatnot, which is fair. But the way he talks about God and archetypes and the psyche and, you know, his existential grounding, he doesn't like to use a lot of philosophical language, but you can tell that he's thought it through and the way he articulates it does tie into, say, an existentialist view of reality. And he has said that a few times and he uses those specific words a few times. And I think his critics perhaps simply haven't absorbed enough of him to see that. Heidegger wanted to take a fresh look at the nature of reality. And so Heidegger's idea was that we, we, we made a fundamental philosophical error way back when, when we were Greek, ancient Greek, roughly speaking, and that we started concentrating on the wrong elements of, he didn't really, he doesn't really call it reality, he calls it being. So a phenomenologist is someone who's concerned with being, and you, you might think, well, what's the difference between being and reality? And the answer to that is, it depends, depends on how you define being, and it depends on how you define reality. So Heidegger's observation was that for, for for modern people, roughly speaking, reality is sort of a deanimated, material, objective substrata. It's, it's dead in its essence, roughly speaking, and the things that are most real are precisely those things. You could think about that as objective reality for all intents and purposes. But when, what Heidegger tried to point out is that there's, it's a choice in some sense. Because your knowledge is finite, because you're fundamentally ignorant about all things, you have to decide that certain things are true and then act from that point. And, you know, Heidegger's point was, there's a lot of things that you can decide about at the very fundamental level of, of axiom. And so one of the things you can decide, for example, is whether or not the objective world is what's more real or whether or not your lived experience is what's more real. 
Yeah, so what was the point? If you go back, you see that he's been consistent on God, but he is moving towards some sort of fundamentalism in some way, perhaps more in his f- political sphere. So I was happy when he spoke to Alex to see that he was pushing back against the the religious fundamentalists. I'll probably pop that section in here. So- the subject of the belief yeah. is a much more grand uh, entity The word belief itself, for them, at least in their question, even if you think it's an inappropriate question, they mean something much more mundane. They mean like you believe in the existence of Well, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what people mean. You know, like one of the things I've noticed, for example, is um, there are no shortage of Christian trolls, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are atheist trolls and there's engineering trolls. There's lots of trolls, but there are Christian trolls. And the Christian trolls, when they ask that question, and it's often the Christian trolls who ask that question, what they mean is, are you in my club? Exactly. Right. Yeah. And my answer is, I'm not even sure you know what club you're in. So there's a trap in the question. You're asking me the question yeah. a materialist atheist would ask. And, and you want me to give you an answer that bolsters your faith, but the presumptions of your question are enlightenment atheistic. So, so this is interesting and nice because he's pointing out that they're actually taking a materialist perspective in the sense that when they describe God or when they describe, you know, divinity, they think they're describing something mind independent that exists outside of them in, a, in the literal material way. See, the frustrating thing is you run out of language. If someone like Peterson is going to dance around the language games over and over again, well, I don't know what it means. It's, it's fair if you take his view from the very beginning and you understand, okay, what is real is not governed by mere matter. What is real is not only structured or constrained by perception, but is in some way actually the, the essence of perception, or per, the essence of perception is in some way real. Okay, and there are layers to that, some of which we don't recognize consciously or directly, but which we act out. You know, you can't uh, access reality only through describing it. It's something that you act out. Okay, the religious fundamentalists are not taking this view. They're not taking this understanding of God as something that's kind of in relation to your perceptual structure. They're taking it as this father in the sky, and that's very reductionistic and simplistic. This is something, this is what he means. As far as I can tell, this is what he believes, this is what he means, and he does not appreciate that fundamentalist, materialist um, view of God. But so rarely will he say that. I was actually pleased to hear him say it to Alex, and I wish Alex had pushed him a little bit more on those points, because then I was equally swung the other way to hear him say that if you took the Panasonic to the cave, he suspects you would see Jesus walk out. Now, this seemed to me a cowardly cop-out, and I wish Alex had pushed him more too, although I'm glad to see, you know, they've preserved their relationship. Alex recently moderated a debate between him and Dawkins, or a discussion perhaps. So, you know, maybe it's the long game, it's going to be better. But this seems like a cowardly answer because I, he pauses, I suspect yes, and then they move on. There's absolutely no way, if he's consistent with who he's been in the past, that he believes <laughs> the yes answer to that question satisfies what all the religious people are thinking it satisfies. And there's absolutely no way that he thinks Jesus... was one man who died and rose again um, and was in communion with God and died on the cross. And if you believe and pray to him, you will be saved from a lake of fire. There's no way he believes in this fundamentalist story. Now, he may believe pieces of it. I've heard him say that the Christian, um, Christian assertion is singular because it asserts that God divinity actually came down and walked among us and became a man and that that's very rare um that it was an actual historical event about which we have some record he says those are you know very bold claims that kind of make um the idea of divinity incarnate which kind of for him stands out as unique among other religions where God is probably something more judgmental and distant or something more abstract or a pantheon of gods that are more kind of representative of the pieces in us. But he also says this, and I, I wish I wish both his critics and his, his fans would recognize this. The fundamentalists need to hear him talk about the Greek gods. They're these personalities that possess us, anger and lust, and, you know, they drive us in ways we cannot understand. And if we don't treat, if we don't negotiate with them... Um, wisely, then they come to control us and and we have to make them offer. You know, he'll speak about the Greek gods in this way, which is completely incompatible with what the fundamentalists are hoping he believes. And also it would satisfy more of the skeptics that he's taking a wiser, more philosophical, you know, more um, wiser approach and more truthful approach to religion in general. But it feels like 
it feels like there's so little overlap between these populations that the skeptics only focus on his, you know, political stuff and the more dogmatic assertions about religion and the fundamentalists only focus on, oh, that one line, he said that he suspects you would see come, someone come out. And there were so many videos from Christians coming out in that day. You know, Peterson's coming closer. We knew it. We knew it. And as far as I can tell, politically, he is, and I, I, there is this annoying thing that happens where you see it in Musk, you see it in Rogan, you see it in even recently in Anna Kasparian or, you know, Tulsi Gabbard, 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 um, the Weinsteins, where when you feel betrayed by your side, you feel like you stood for a certain sort of virtue, like a free speech, say, and then it's betrayed by the side that you thought um, protected it more rigorously. And then you run to the other side and you start to see the malice. And I'll have to do a better breakdown on this, but you all know what I'm saying. All these guys have just run to conservatism probably a little too extremely. And they seem to attribute malice much more freely to the liberals than they ought, you know? So I wish these groups would acknowledge, but it's so difficult because Peter himself doesn't acknowledge. So when Alex or anyone asks, you know, what Harris is saying here, all these people applauding feel like their views have been cashed out by what you've just said. And you're a man, a human, race speaking this language, you're smart. Can, can you just forget about the word games and I don't know what that means and well what it means is what we act out and I don't see can you just acknowledge that what you're thinking is not what they're thinking and and he's so slippery here and it's very frustrating um you know he returns to this thing of what we believe is what we act out this structure the religious structure is a part of us you know maybe God is a part of us we are in conversation with reality and this is what has emerged and I wish when he said these things the fundamentalists would listen because they would understand what he means when he slides into story explaining mode or myth analyzing mode and starts just saying that's what god is that's what the hero is the warrior has to return with the gold and you know it's, it's not unless you're adding this other piece which is some probabilistic claim that yes this book probably was dictated by an omniscient being unlike any other book well or maybe the muslims are right that archangel not... gabriel did show up to muhammad in his cave and give him the one final revelation never to be superseded and it just on the merits of the text we know that's not true we know for all it gets wrong and all it fails to get right about the nature of our circumstance we know that book is not the best book ever written on any topic and here i'm speaking of the quran but it's true of the bible it's true it's true of, of the meditations of marcus aurelius but the but but no one's claiming that about the, the meditations and that's a crucial difference it's a difference that that explains so much unnecessary suffering in our world. And the, again, what I fear about the way you talk about religion is that be, at, at the end of all these conversations, I'm still not sure what you believe on that point, frankly. And if I'm not sure, no one out there is. Well, I don't know why, I don't know why you would expect to be sure about... <laughs> I don't know why. See, this is... It's in you, and you're acting it out, and I'm just describing it, which which is smart. I mean, that's what philosophers do. As soon as you get ba beyond fundamental reality, or how does logic work, you know? Or is there a world of forms or not? You have to start talking about the ways we act that we don't yet um, describe accurately, or that we don't yet have a mechanism for understanding. That's what philosophy and thinking is supposed to be about. I'm making a video on, you know, we need to recognize Peterson as a philosopher. Going to be probably controversial, but it's just absolutely what we're supposed to be about. And yet, Harris is completely correct. What someone believes. How do you think that any one of you are capable of fully articulating what you believe? You certainly uh, aren't. You are in, not. In, in that's completely ridiculous. You're not transparent to yourself by any stretch of the imagination. Well, you act out all sorts of things that you I, can't articulate. But, but, but how, about a, how about a best guess? Yeah. You know, if you yes. look, let's go That's off. the thing, a best guess. That's what the rationalist view is. Okay, the things we can assert, the things we can guess, are done through the scientific process, through making these models, describing, labeling, hypothesizing, testing. You know? And... If we're going to use symbolism and narrative, that's okay. It's going to bleed into realms which are much more difficult to measure. And Peterson would agree with that. And he would say, it's necessary. We need those stories. And then Harris would point to the dogma and the harm it causes and say, okay, well, not these ones at least. Or at least they're not ultimately true. They need to be evolved. 
cognitive neuroscience on this, shall we? 99% of your processing is unconscious. <laughs> You're not capable of articulating yourself. <laughs> if you were, you'd be omniscient. Okay, but that, so don't but, give me any nonsense yeah, about that. But that, that is a... <laughs> I've, I've never heard so many people applaud an evasion of a, of a, a, a simple question. <laughs> it was a good one. Yeah, though. yeah. <laughs> okay, I honestly, you, yes, everything at, you just said about not being there. fully transparent to yourself is true, and you are ruled by committee in there all the time, no doubt. But I'm a, I'm asking what you actually believe. I mean, there's, there's several things I can ask. I, can ask. I mean, almost any one of these threads can can pull the whole tapestry, but to take Christianity as an example, what do you believe about this, the origin of this sacred book, the Bible, Old and New Testament? Do you believe that just maybe it has a status unlike any other book, or is it simply old writing? See, and there you can't say it does definitionally or self-evidently because it's the book on which the whole corpus of western blah 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 is based or because it's you know come to dominate the world you cannot make these arguments because they're they're arguments from natural selection and you can use the words like transcendent or divine as descriptors if you want but it, you're remaining firmly nested in the realm of the the rational and the material and then if you're going to posit anything beyond that you know, like an actual God, divine or God, you're, it, it's an analog, or you have to make the sort of claim Sam is challenging him to make here. Of human beings, just like ourselves. I think it's both. <laughs> okay, so, but, but, but so what does that mean? You're, you're, saying, you're saying that someone needs to ask him. Taking... Someone needs to sit him down and ask him more, a more pointed series of questions, like Alex did. There were like probably three questions, and you know, he was trying to go soft because he's preserving a very valuable conversation, which I agree is valuable. And you know, there is a hunger for something that Peterson is offering, so I don't even know what I'm offering in its place, you know? Perhaps perhaps returning to the stories with awe and reverence, forgetting some of our desire to debunk them, acting out the rituals in small communities, and continuing to explore and evolve the rituals as we want, as our community becomes more multicultural and, you know, more scientifically aware combined with, you know, artistic, creative, ongoing exploration, because we don't want to just remain in the same artistic, in, in awe of the same altars all the time, you know, we want to take part in the creative process, so continue to, it's, it's just very difficult, because everything needs to be nested together. I, I believe that there's a great hunger for ritual, and we're seeing a return, and we're going to continue to see a return to fairy tales and embodied art and small communities if we can, if we can pull ourselves away from our screens and our little cells of isolation long enough. And, you know, if we get 3D printing and AI integrated with robots, and if it all goes well, we can return to small communities and, you know, uh, 3D print everything we need and live, you know, our neighbor's children and all our friends playing in the fields as we sit on our porches and, you know dip into VR to commune with commune with darkness itself. I like to imagine some sort of future where all the checkboxes of our evolved biology, the desire for ritual and community are ticked and none of the negative ones are ticked and somehow technology allows us to just hop right over the negatives and embrace the positives. I don't know if that's possible, but certainly it seems like we need some sort of ritual and there's a hunger to return to that. I just don't know what it looks like. And this is what Peter's, this is what this conversation is. Really, no one else is having these conversations. So however flawed they are and however, however much we quibble, we need to bridge this. And it's probably a constant bridge. It's probably a constant dialogue. That's probably the heart of it. But there is obviously a hunger that's fresh and unique and a sense that things are going downhill in some new way and we hope to resolve that so what is peterson offering i'm not sure i don't think he wants everyone to just go back to churches in the old sense if he does i would disagree with him and yet you know so they should challenge him harris should challenge him what exactly are you saying here beyond these are useful stories and then he should challenge harris what are you i mean is your meditation going to be enough to unite humanity certainly it seems enough for harris not for dawkins in dictation 
Or Alex is un- O'Connor, maybe. Unlike any other dictation. So, so Homer, though well, creative, Sam, or like Shakespeare, we, though creative, like was, was doing something else. It's not like we understand the sources of inspiration. Okay, but, you the, know, the, if you but talk everyone's to creative been inspired. People, if you talk to creative people, yes, you know, okay, they, basically, so, they often describe themselves as something approximating a conduit through which higher wisdom is pouring. Again, you're and, dodging. <laughs> yes, Shakespeare, that Shakespeare yes. could say that. And yeah. We just need to acknowledge the language games that are being played here, that Peterson's fundamental starting point is not the materialist rationalist starting point. He does not believe reality is something that exists outside of here, the mind. He thinks the language necessary for describing that is religious language. So we represent it as personalities or spirits. But he needs to acknowledge that it's not what everyone else is meaning. So it's a, it's a very philosophical sort of language game. And Harris is actually using the, the everyman's language game in a much more intuitive, accessible way. And any writer can say that, right? And it's also the case that we would, or, we would rank organize, we would rank order those writers, which is why you pointed to Shakespeare, in terms of the generalizable validity of their revelations. Sure. And so, well, look, so, so you run into the same issue. You know, you criticize the Bible and look, fair enough, you know. But you're, you're also evading a very important issue, which is how do you, how do you quantitatively rank the contributions of literature without you, you, assuming that there's you, a hierarchy of revelation? You, you, oh, no, oh, this is a hierarchy yeah, yeah. Of so wisdom. this is him saying the Bible's at the bottom, so it's you know, sure, self-evidently a, hi, the hierarchy divine. hierarchy of human wisdom. I will grant you that every day of the week. But, this, it is, but we're talking about primates like ourselves having conversations. And this is the See, most See, what they need to do is just pose that question again and again in various pointed ways like Alex did the Panasonic question which is it's it's funny because this is the way that the abstract theory is snapped down into reality is with silly examples or with very concrete examples that can be you know rejected or accepted game we can play I mean this this is the best game in town and it has always been so but people are imagining and, and it includes as you said at the outset, what I would call spiritual experience. And spiritual experience is it admits of a fact-based discussion about the nature of human consciousness. And Why you know, do you allow that as an exception? What they should ask, what Peterson should ask the more skeptical types, types like Dawkins, they just have such different brains. This is the problem. They're just going to need to acknowledge we have differently structured brains. Peterson resonates more with story. He's going to speak more to people who resonate with story. Dawkins resonates more with whatever, you know, people who like to connect dots in this way. He's going to resonate more with people like that. They're going to be concerned about different things, wary about different things, and they're going to be using different sorts of language. But he needs to pose them that sort of question exactly. And spiritual experience is admits of a fact-based discussion about the nature of human consciousness. And That right there. Can you describe the nature of human consciousness without appealing to spiritual language? How would you describe what we care about without using words that admit the, the value dimension of reality? Um, Harris does it by affirming spirituality in his way, in his meditation and whatnot. And, Why know, do you allow that as an exception? Like, it, because it's not an exception. It's part of the, the, the data set. So it's possible this to have the spiritual. Ex- so this is spiritual experience without the possible of possibility of concretized revelation. No. So it's a formless spirituality that you're advocating. No, 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 no. He should ask him. Do you agree that whatever seems to be spiritual or me- whatever seems to govern the spiritual or meaning sphere is governed entirely by, um, say, natural law? Or seems to be governed entirely by natural law, and to the degree to which you require supernatural or transcendent language to describe it, it doesn't imply a, you know, um, super, superordinate being. It implies simply that whatever the nature of reality is, whatever the nature of consciousness... See, then Peterson's just going to run to consciousness. He, he's just going to appeal to, well, consciousness is a mystery and we don't know how to... And then it just kind of cycles back around and around until we explain consciousness through language. He's never going to be satisfied with positing that everything is nested in mathematics. And oh, he should, though. He should. I think he would agree to that. No, it, 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 you, you can have... I'm not, even, I'm not even discounting the possibility that there are invisible entities out there in the universe far smarter than ourselves who we could possibly be in dialogue with. I mean, the, the, there are many strange ideas that we, we could defend to one or another degree. I mean, you, there, there are people walking around speculating that we might be living in a computer simulation, that all of this is being run on some hard drive. Of- <laughs> that actually becomes like one of the more plausible theories when you think about it, supposedly, a lot of people think. The future, or 
or some you know alien supercomputer. Now that you can actually, I mean, Nick Bostrom at Oxford gives a very cogent argument in defense of that thesis, right? Now you can you can deal with that on its merits. I'm not saying the universe isn't stranger than we suppose or even can suppose, but one thing we know is that when you read the Bible, you can turn every page of that book, and you will not find evidence of omniscience. You, you will not find anything in there that someone as smart as Shakespeare, or actually a little bit dumber, could have written. No, right? I don't think that's true, Sam. They're you know, incredibly the, the, there's, Whatever there's, else well, you I, might the, say about the biblical writings, uh, they're incredibly uh, potent. Yeah, but, but when he describes the potency, it's an appeal to this generational distillation of ideas. So, I mean, I don't know. Would he say someone could wake up and write the story of Cain and Abel if they were born on an island and never knew any humans before? He would probably say they absolutely could not. Yeah. Um, which maybe is a claim not all materialists would, or not all Sam's type would agree with. But the, the, the point is, when he describes the potency, he describes basically natural selection. And I think Harris is frustrated that he won't acknowledge that in the face of the fundamentalists, say. He'll, t he'll describe it as revelation. He'll use that word when really what he means is, you know, a meme, a distilled meme passed along through natural selection. But, 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 so, but, but so it's, it's impossible to write something, it's virtually impossible to write something like Cain and Abel. It's okay. a paragraph so, so long. So you're, you're, saying, you're saying the Shakespeare, the Shakespeare of, of 3,000 years ago couldn't have written Genesis? He couldn't have written Cain and Abel, not in 10 so, sentences. So then, so then who Cain you, and Abel is 10 sentences long. So then who you, What more. Peterson should really say here is, I'm saying the entire thing that makes Shakespeare, like sure, he has some individual you know, genius and, uh, you know, fates converge to produce this exact specimen, but he is a human and he's nested in the broader human structure, um, which carries all these things that he's deriving his stories from. More wisdom than you can than you can dig out okay, in a well, lifetime. Okay, so, so now we're, but now we're getting to the nub of it. Then mm -hmm. you think that it was not the product of a human mind? I think it was the product of a vast collection of human minds working over millennia. Okay, so we and have then, a, we have a committee of okay. There, so he said that Shakespeare's. So, but still, we're just sure, dealing with sure. people. We still, well, we've just got people. Well, but that's and, look, and this, but this concession, if indeed you're making it, yes. And and they need to catch him on those. Sure, sure. When he says, fair enough, look, fair enough, man. They need to catch him there and they need to interrogate that because this, not 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 to prove him wrong because what he's offering is, I think, brilliant, but at least certainly necessary and important in, in our age now. But to interrogate that to arrive at the thing we need to do next, the way to change. I'm still not sure, is the eradication of traditional Christianity. Well, if, if something is yes, deeply absolutely. wide, it's, it's reflective of a deeper reality. Otherwise, yes. it wouldn't be wise. I'm, okay, I'm, so I'm in what's love the, with deeper realities. So what's the deeper reality that something as wise as the story of Cain yeah. and Abel reflects? It, 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 what's it, the reality? It, 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 a landscape of mind that we, we are, uh, that either takes great training, great luck, or pharmacological bombardment of the human brain to explore. Right there, there's a way. There are ways to get there. There are ways to have the beatific vision, right? And and if and can you do it without story? We will see. Can you do it without religious dogmatic story? I would certainly hope so. And look, atheism is very new. So for all its failings, it's it's converging in time right now with all these other wacky things like technology and social media and nuclear and mass, mass, mass cultural mingling on a scale hitherto undreamt of. We have a lot of things we're experimenting with here, and the religiously inclined should not be too triumphant in pointing to the negatives right now and attributing them wholly to atheism. Um, I mean, me, from my deterministic perspective, that's just fairly easy to say. I would say all of this is inevitable. We have to move forward in the best way possible. We have to do better stories that have less dogma. That's what we're going to do. We're going to succeed or fail. Let's see. Let's do the best we can through conversations like this, I guess. We, well, we understand this to some degree but experientially, and we can understand it uh, to some degree by, by third-person per methods of science. And it's not, it's not like I don't know. I mean, I've had many experiences that if I had them in a religious context would have counted for me as evidence of the truth of my religion. Right? But I suspect Sam has had more than Jordan, right? Jordan's mentioned some before that he's taken like extremely high doses of mushrooms. Was it once? I don't remember. But anyway. Because I, 
I'm, I have, was not brought up, up in a religious context. That's that, and, I guess. And because I spend a lot of time seeing the downside of...